Um, the next speaker, who's another colleague, uh, Dr. Gerardo Finicario, um, who's a consultant cardiologist at the Brompton, um, also a GSTT, um, and also does research over at St. George's. Um, so uh, he's going to speak to us about arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Uh, so thanks very much, Gerardo, um, and looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. Thank you very much, Amanda. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this really great um, um, learning and teaching opportunity. I hope you can see my slides. Can you just confirm it? Yes, we can see your slides. They're not yet in presentation mode. But Fantastic. Fantastic. Perfect. OK, all right, perfect. So um, I've been asked to talk about arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. And uh, I would like to start from the definition. So we should ask the question, what is arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy? And uh, I would use uh, this uh, definition from this uh, review published in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago. So arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy is a heritable uh, disease uh, which predominantly affects the right ventricle. And the histological hallmark of the disease is the progressive loss of uh, right ventricular myocardium and replacement with fibro fatty tissue. We know that uh, uh, the genetic cause of arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy is to be found in the, um, in the desmosomes, which uh, um, are uh, genes that encode for proteins that basically constitutes the glue that keeps together the sarcomeres, both from a structural and electrical standpoint. How do we make diagnosis of arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy? I will start uh, uh, discussing the uh, so-called revised uh, task force criteria, which were published in 2010. And the first document actually was published in 1994. And this document provided some, uh, some revision and some new criteria. So the revised task force criteria put together a series of uh, features deriving from many cardiac investigation and from clinical and family history of the patient. And um, these features are put together uh, developing a score that would define indeed uh, a patient that uh, have, have that condition. And particularly the test that we are looking at is the ECG, the echocardiogram, cardiac MRI, Holton monitor, uh, and of course, uh, as we said, um, clinical personal history of the patient and family history. Um, there are various uh, way of, of presenting um, with ARVC, and I will say that uh, in many patients uh, uh, there are no symptoms. Uh, in some patients there are uh, symptoms that are mainly palpitations, syncope, and sometimes, unfortunately, the first presentation of the disease may be sudden cardiac death. Sometimes um, ARVC is, fi is found incidentally uh, because, for example, the individual um, uh, is investigated with an ECG for other reasons or for, uh, for screening, and uh, the ECG is abnormal and leads uh, to further investigations. Here we have a, a clear example of an ECG of a patient with arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, and there are some features that are quite classical, typically the T-wave inversion in the anterior leads from V1 to V4, and the, um, and the low voltages, uh, which in this case are diffused both in the limb leads and in the precordial leads. As we said, um, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy may present, unfortunately, with the uh, sudden cardiac death or out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, often in athletes, as uh, is the case of uh, um, David Astori, who was um, a Serie A uh, football player uh, in Italy, um, who uh, suffered sudden cardiac death, and uh, um, a, a detailed post-mortem examination uh, was consistent with uh, arrhythmogenic uh, right ventricular cardiomyopathy. And uh, this case um, uh, led uh, to uh, quite a lot of controversy because the ECG was uh, revised after the death of the player and uh, there were subtle abnormalities uh, 
that uh, um, were found. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, the doctor who analyzed this ECG was found uh, guilty. So as we said, AIVC is a common cause of sudden cardiac death in athletes, uh, as uh, shown by uh, this uh, study from uh, uh, Corrado's group uh, in Italy. Uh, this is a study on sudden death victims uh, in the Veneto region of Italy, where all the post-mortem examination were performed by an expert cardiopathologist. And we see that indeed uh, ARVC is the most common cause of sudden death, uh, and there is uh, a higher risk of sudden death uh, in athletes versus non-athletes in this specific condition. And these are data from, uh, from St. George's University, um, uh, particularly from uh, the uh, sudden cardiac death database led by Professor Mary Shepard. Uh, as uh, probably many of you know, um, um, as St. George is uh, partly funded by, by cardiac risk in the young, uh, there is a, a database which collects more than uh, 6,000 uh, cases of, of sudden death, uh, mainly in young individuals. In this study, we were able to um, analyze uh, uh, data, post-mortem and clinical data of 357 athletes, and we found that uh, in 13 percent of cases, uh, uh, the cause was a rheumogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Um, to be an athlete and to die suddenly does not mean that uh, sudden death or cardiac arrest would occur during exertion. This is the case in 61% of, of athletes in our cohort, but uh, in the remaining 39% of the cases, sudden death occurred during daily activities or um, as sleep, during sleep. Um, ARVC seems to be associated with exercise-induced arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy with uh, uh, implications for uh, sports participation in individuals that uh, are diagnosed with arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. So we uh, mentioned uh, the fact that, that ARVC is a common cause of sudden death in athletes. Um, it's particularly relevant to think that uh, uh, there may be some overlap in terms of diagnosis between ARVC and uh, the so-called athlete's heart, which is a broad term that um, means that there are several physiological uh, changes uh, um, which are mainly electrical, structural and functional as a result of long-term training in athletes. And often these changes uh, occur also in the right ventricle with repolarization abnormalities in the anterior leads uh, and right ventricular dilatation. This of course makes it more complicated and more challenging to differentiate between ARVC and um, athlete's heart. Going back to the uh, task force criteria, which uh, uh, for, for many years have been the main uh, um, diagnostic criteria used uh, widely in clinical practice, uh, we said that uh, there are various uh, tests and various features that are considered for diagnosis. Uh, but we have to remember that the task force criteria do not provide uh, um, a test which is the gold standard. There is not a test that would tell us, uh, well, this patient has ARVC, which of course is a limitation. From a structural standpoint, uh, there are uh, several changes that we will describe uh, in the next few minutes. This is one of the typical abnormalities seen in a patient with uh, uh, a right ventricular, a rheumogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy with significant right ventricular structural changes. We see that uh, there is a, a right ventricular systolic dysfunction and there are um, microaneurysm at the level of the base of the right ventricle at the level of the subtricuspidal uh, sub region. Something that I think is very important to discuss uh, is that uh, something has changed, especially in, I would say in the last uh, 10 years uh, regarding terminology and nomenclature in ARVC. We said that a rheumogenic right ventricle cardiomyopathy is a heritable heart disease uh, that predominantly affects the right ventricle. But the reality is, uh, and I will show you um, in the next slide a few studies that, uh, um, that um, uh, emphasize this point, uh, we're realizing uh, increasingly that a rheumogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy uh, 
is instead a disease of both ventricles. So we should really call it a rheumogenic cardiomyopathy. And uh, uh, we realized that uh, both ventricles are involved uh, in the condition um, with the help, I would say, of two uh, main tools uh, that um, um, created, I would say, uh, a quite significant Copernican revolution in our understanding of inherited cardiac conditions, which are uh, cardiac MRI and genetics. And I will explain you why. So um, cardiac MRI, uh, for sure, um, is able, enable us to look uh, uh, in more detail at the left ventricle and particularly has something that, of course, echocardiography cannot provide. With the late cardiac enhancement, we're able to understand if there is uh, uh, fibrosis at the level of the left ventricle. And uh, therefore, if there are abnormalities that are suggesting of an arrhythmogenic phenotype, uh, if there is late cardiac enhancement and fibrosis, we're able to uh, state with a high level of confidence that uh, there is a significant involvement of the left ventricle. This is one of, of the first study dealing with this particular uh, uh, topic uh, and particularly with the, the so-called left dominant rheumogenic cardiomyopathy, so a condition where the uh, involvement is main at the level of the left ventricle with often unexplained arrhythmia of left ventricular origin, inferolateral T-wave inversion and DCG, often accompanied by diffuse low voltages and apparent DCM phenotype. And uh, uh, genetics as well helped us uh, a lot in this process. This is a recent study that uh, uh, analyzed uh, uh, genetic uh, background of patients with presenting with a phenotype of dilated cardiomyopathy. So of dilated cardiomyopathy, not a rheumogenic cardiomyopathy. And we see that uh, there is a, a significant proportion of these patients that uh, um, have uh, some underlying desmosomal uh, gene uh, mutations. And uh, to reiterate this concept, uh, these are data again from St. George's um, on sudden death victims who were diagnosed with uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy at the postmortem examination performed by an expert cardiopathologist. And we see that um, out of uh, more than 200 cases uh, with uh, um, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, 70% had a biventricular involvement. So the old concept of the traditional um, triangle of dysplasia, which uh, is basically confined at the level of the right ventricle, um, can be abandoned, I would say, uh, to um, embrace a more contemporary model of ARVC where the left ventricle is very important and it is part of this triangle, particularly the LV lateral wall. Um, to go back to the uh, task force criteria, I would, I would like just uh, to share with you some unpublished data from St. George's on patients with ARVC uh, investigated our institutions, all of them with cardiac MRI. We see that in most of cases, uh, there was a, a biventricular involvement with uh, different uh, genetic mutation found in the biventricular uh, phenotype uh, in comparison with the right dominant um, and the left dominant phenotype. And 46% of these patients did not have, uh, did not fulfill the uh, CMR task force criteria. So almost half of them, which is uh, quite remarkable. And um, this patient that did not fulfill criteria had other abnormalities that suggested the, um, the condition, suggested the presence of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, specifically left ventricular involvement, but also regional wall motion abnormalities at the level of the right ventricle or the status of genotype positive or other uh, criteria, for example, ECG or Holter criteria. So looking particularly at cardiac MRI, where are the abnormalities? So what do we have to, to look at uh, specifically? So we may have some abnormalities that, that are confined at the level of the right ventricle. Let's have a look always at the right ventricular outflow tract uh, where we can see, for example, aneurysm or enlargement, RV wall thinning, global or regional systolic um, dysfunction, but also ventricular dilatation or fiber fatty replacement in some cases. We have to be, of course, very attentive and looking at the uh, 
um, um, late gallium enhancement and specifically subepicardial uh, late gallium enhancement at the level of the lateral wall, which is highly suggestive of, of the condition, of course, in the appropriate clinical context. So uh, this uh, concept of including the left ventricular and late gallium enhancement in the criteria for defining a rheumogenic cardiomyopathy has been embraced by uh, the so-called Padua criteria, which has been published uh, a couple of years ago. And as you see, particularly the, 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 this criteria uh, include the left ventricle for the first time. And uh, uh, as far as cardiac MRI is concerned, the so-called LV, LVLG stria pattern, so the mid-wall uh, subepicardial LGE is included in this criterion. And this, of course, uh, is uh, I think that the authors have to be applauded for developing this criteria. However, we have to consider that LGE and also the stria pattern and uh, the subepicardial or mid-wall pattern is just a feature, is not uh, a condition itself. It's just a feature that uh, is uh, common to many other conditions. And Therefore, I think that there is a problem of specificity, including the left ventricle, including these specific uh, um, features, uh, which leads us to many issues uh, um, regarding terminology and nomenclature and classification, specifically in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. A few words about the management of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So when we have a diagnosis, what should we do? So there are four points that I would like to make. First of all, uh, lifestyle changes. So uh, patients with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy should not engage in competitive sports. This is a condition where um, intense competitive sports have been demonstrated to be deleterious for the patients, uh, both from a phenotypic expression standpoint, but also for uh, an increased propensity to develop ventricular arrhythmias. <coughs> Uh, antiarrhythmics. Antiarrhythmics uh, may be used in this condition in patients with uh, an ICD and multiple shocks. So it's something that uh, may be considered. Beta blockers may be considered as well, uh, again, in patients with recurrent VTs who do not have an ICD or uh, patients who have an ICD and have multiple shocks, maybe in association with antiarrhythmics. And then, of course, in patients with left ventricular systolic dysfunction, for heart failure tra treatment. Catheter ablation is something that may be used in patients with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, especially in patients with incessant VT or frequent appropriate ICD shocks, despite the use of antiarrhythmics, including amiodarone. One of the major um, topic of interest in this condition, I think, is the choice of uh, proceeding with uh, an implantable cardioverter defibrillator and it's a very controversial topic. Uh, we have some international registries, we have some schools, uh, we have some limitations also in these international registries. Uh, um, and I would like just to, to summarize for you what the uh, main cardiology society uh, propose and recommend around the world. So I think that there is um, a, a minimal common dem denominator to all car cardiovascular society um, saying that basically there are few patients that should receive an implantable cardioverter defibrillator if possible. And these are patients who suffered a previous cardiac arrest, patients that suffer sustained VTs, uh, and patients that have systolic dysfunction, either, in, either of the left ventricle or the right ventricle or both ventricles. The rest uh, is uh, mainly based on consensus opinion, it's uh, considered to be an intermediate risk or low risk. There are some features that may be considered uh, in the uh, choice in the strategy of implanting a cardioverter, implantable cardioverter defibrillator in primary prevention. So these are my take home messages. Um, uh, Arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy is an increasingly diagnosed clinical entity, is a possible cause of sudden cardiac death in young individuals and in athletes, so we have to be very careful in, uh, um, in looking at baseline tests and taking a very uh, thorough clinical and family history of the patient in order to look for possible red flags. Um, there, is, there, there has been 
I would say, a, kind of a revolution in terms of nomenclature and uh, um, terminology in terms of, of uh, for, for arimogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, which I think we should call nowadays arimogenic cardiomyopathy. Um, and for sure, cardiac MRI and genetics uh, helped us in uh, understanding more about left ventricular involvement in this disease. Uh, for sure, terminology and classifications are challenging in this condition. Uh, there are evolving criteria to establish um, a diagnosis of ARVC, which are beyond the task force criteria, which again have been published more than 10 years ago. Uh, clinical management, management uh, um, I would say that uh, is often consensus based uh, with no robust evidence and lack of uh, randomized control trial. Thank you very much for your attention.